Welcome to Deep Lore, the podcast that delves into the darkest and most harrowing true stories from history. I'm your host, Matt Jarbo, and today we're going to be exploring a trio of chilling cases that shook the world. First, we'll examine the tragic 2007 murder-suicide of professional wrestler Chris Benoit, whose shocking actions left the sports entertainment community reeling. Then we'll step back decades to relive the horrifying on-air suicide of news anchor Christine Chubbuck, a moment that forever changed the landscape of live television. Finally, we'll uncover the disappearances of Pam Nader and Nancy Leichner, two young women whose lives were cut short in the prime of their lives. Through meticulous research and compelling storytelling, we'll attempt to make sense of these unthinkable acts and the complex psychological factors that may have driven them. Brace yourselves as we're about to venture into the darkest corners of the human experience. This is Deep Lore. In the summer of 2007, one of professional wrestling's most respected and talented performers shattered his own legacy in an act of unfathomable violence. Chris Benoit, known globally as the Canadian Crippler for his intense, brilliant skill set, had reached the mountaintop of sports entertainment success. But his journey from being a schoolboy wrestling fan in Canada to a world heavyweight champion in the WWE was one paved in physical and mental brutality that culminated in an unspeakable tragedy. Christopher Michael Benoit was born on May 21, 1967 in Montreal, Quebec, before being raised in Edmonton, Alberta. From the moment he witnessed wrestlers like the Dynamite Kid, Tom Billington, and Bret Hart from a young age, the tenacious Benoit found his life's passion. At just 12 years old, the diminutive underdog attended a local wrestling event and immediately decided he wanted to turn his fandom into a career between the ropes. His path into the professional ranks began with the infamous and demanding Hart Dungeon, where he trained under the tutelage of Stu Hart and his clan of wrestlers. While his small stature and looks drew comparisons to Dynamite Kid, Benoit cultivated an intense, hard-hitting style between the ropes that emulated his other idol, the excellence of one Bret Hart. Through Hart's demanding regimen of fundamental wrestling, the young upstart built a reputation for his toughness, commitment, and willingness to put his own body on the line. This unrelenting approach to his craft paved dividends as Benoit graduated to the independent circuit. After years of honing his skills for promotions like Stampede Wrestling and New Japan Pro Wrestling, he got his big break when he was signed by the World Championship Wrestling in 1994. Instantly, Benoit became a mainstay of the company's cruiserweight division, capturing championship gold and global fame with his high risk and hard hitting matches. When the WCW was purchased by the World Wrestling Federation, the WWF, later the WWE in 2001, Benoit's mainstream stardom was cemented. He joined the upper echelon of WWE's stacked roster, aligning himself with other wrestling trailblazers like Eddie Guerrero while engaging in memorable feuds with the likes of Kurt Angle, the Radicals, and more. His unmistakable intensity and skill in the ring were finally achieving the global recognition he had dreamed of. But the pinnacle of Chris Benoit's professional life came at WrestleMania 20 in March 2004 when he won the World Heavyweight Championship in the main event. His epic triple threat match against Triple H and Shawn Michaels was lauded as one of the greatest wrestling performances of all time. And over the next three years, Benoit remained at the top of the WWE, capturing multiple titles, while also cementing his reputation as a locker room leader and an inspiration to young wrestlers everywhere. But despite the success, behind the scenes, the rabid Wolverine was becoming increasingly unstable due to a number of possible factors. Brain trauma from years of headshots, undetected mental health issues, drug abuse, and a failing marriage. This deadly combination of factors came to a horrific head in a three-day stretch in June 2007 that would ultimately shock the sports entertainment world for years to come. On the evening of June 22, 2007, in the upscale suburban home he shared with his wife Nancy and their seven-year-old son Daniel in Fayetteville, Georgia, Benoit committed his first act of violence. 
According to the police report, the 240-pound Benoit bound his wife's limbs with duct tape and coaxial cables before violently strangling her to death with a cord made from one of his weight machines. Her body was then wrapped in a bloody towel and laid on the floor next to a Bible. The following morning on June 23rd, Benoit continued his disturbing assault by entering Daniel's bedroom, where the small boy lay unconscious after being sedated with Xanax. Benoit then murdered his son through asphyxiation before leaving his body bound in his own blood-stained bed next to another Bible. Over the next day, Benoit remained in the home with the decomposing bodies of his slain wife and young son. He consolidated more weightlifting equipment and Bibles while calling colleagues with lies about Nancy and Daniel suffering from food poisoning as an excuse for his absences. Finally, in the early mornings of June 24, 2007, Chris Benoit ended his own life through hanging himself inside his home weight room, tying a self-made noose from the pulley of one of the machines. When fellow wrestlers and staff failed to hear from Benoit for a return show in Texas, they called local law enforcement to check on the home on the morning of June 25th. What they discovered was a horrifying and grisly crime scene, the bodies of the former world champion, his wife, and young son surrounded by weightlifting equipment, Bibles, and apparently significant decomposition. As news broke of Benoit's unthinkable actions, close friends, fans, and authorities were left grappling to comprehend what could drive such an accomplished athlete to murder his family in such a brutal fashion. As law enforcement searched for answers in the aftermath of Chris Benoit's unfathomable actions, a strange phenomenon surrounding the case began unfolding on Wikipedia and foreshadowed the wild speculation and conspiracy theories yet to come. Nearly 14 hours before the bodies were discovered in the Benoit family home on the morning of June 25th, an anonymous user had edited Chris Benoit's Wikipedia page to state that his wife Nancy was dead. The morbid edit was made just after midnight, inserting the claim with no citation that Benoit had missed a scheduled wrestling event due to the death of his wife Nancy. For over a day, the uncorroborated statement remained on his Wikipedia page, generating confusion across the website's editor community. Some demanded sources to verify the shocking news about Nancy's purported death, while others dismissed it as an unsubstantiated rumor mill started by an internet troll. However, once Benoit's double murder-suicide was discovered and reported to the media, the bizarre Wikipedia edit took on an entirely new level of intrigue and speculation. Investigators revealed that the anonymous editor's IP address actually placed them within the same Stamford, Connecticut region as WWE's corporate headquarters. This led numerous news outlets and personalities to rapidly theorize that the editor may have had some inside information about the Benoit family tragedy prior to the bodies being found. Some went so far as to suggest that it could have been an intentional cover-up by someone within the WWE to throw off investigators. Fox News, not shockingly, stoked the flames by inaccurately reporting the scenario as an exclusive story they had uncovered about Wikipedia editors somehow being privy to the details of Benoit's crimes hours before the police. Prominent TV journalists like Geraldo Rivera declared it an unthinkable coincidence and wildly improbable that anyone could have randomly made such a claim without prior knowledge of the murders. The fervor became so intense that the anonymous editor was forced to come forward on Wikipedia itself and retract the edit as a complete coincidence. Identifying as an IP user from Stanford, they stated that they simply had seen unsubstantiated rumors circulating online about a family emergency involving Benoit and his wife and irresponsibly posted them without fact-checking or verifying any sources. While bringing clarity to the strange situation, the editor's confession did little to halt rampant skepticism and conspiracy theorizing across the internet and media about how could have someone known Benoit's wife was already deceased before the public did. In the end, 
The Wikipedia controversy only compounded the aura of mystery surrounding the tragic murders and embedded it into the public consciousness in a way that still reverberates today, almost 20 years later. On a summer morning in 1974, millions of television viewers were confronted with the unthinkable. A bright and promising 29-year-old newscaster taking her own life in a shocking act of violence live on the air. In the decades since, the haunting story of Christine Chubbuck has become the stuff of myth and mystery. Behind the shattered, televised suicide was a brilliant mind plagued by misery, depression, and a torment that even her closest family could not comprehend before it was too late. But who was Christine Chubbuck? Well, her journey began in Hudson, Ohio on August 24th, 1944, when she was born to Margaretha and George Chubbuck. An intelligent and precocious child, she showed early affinity for performance and media. At the prestigious Laurel School for Girls in Shaker Heights, she participated in theater productions and even formed a tongue-in-cheek dateless wonder club with other girls who didn't have any dates on Saturday nights. An amusing yet subtle hint at the loneliness that would later torment her. But despite her burgeoning talents, her teenage years were shadowed by mental health struggles. Her mother later recalled that her daughter frequently slipped in depressive episodes and had suicidal thoughts that the family didn't fully comprehend at the time. Nevertheless, Christine seemed normal and therefore pursued her passion for broadcasting. After a year of studying theater arts at Miami University, she transferred to Endicott College in Massachusetts before ultimately earning her degree in broadcasting from Boston University in 1965. Christine's academic achievements demonstrated her intellectual prowess and laser-focused drive towards a career on television. Her first media gigs included stints at station like WVIZ in Cleveland from 1966 until 1967, and even attending a prestigious summer workshop at New York University in 1967. Christine gained early experience in Canton, Ohio, and at WQED-TV in Pittsburgh as an assistant producer. But her meteoric rise in the industry was temporarily halted when she spent four years as a hospital computer operator and two more years at a cable TV firm in Sarasota in the late 1960s. Although she outwardly portrayed confidence and capability, demons brewed within Christine's brilliant mind that she couldn't comprehend or control. Her underlying depression and suicidal tendencies that first manifested in youth would ultimately sabotage a promising career and extinguish a brilliant flame far too soon. In the early 1970s, Christine Chubbuck's broadcasting career appeared to finally be taking off. She was hired as a reporter at WXLT-TV, an ABC affiliate in Sarasota, Florida, but the 29-year-old's hard-earned professional achievements would be overshadowed by her own internal struggles with depression and isolation. At WXLT, Christine was tasked with hosting her very own talk program called Suncoast Digest. And this was in addition to her reporting duties, but she took this role very seriously. She invited local officials and community leaders to discuss issues impacting the growing Sarasota slash Brandonton area. Christine even incorporated homemade puppets she had used entertaining disabled children during volunteer work at the local hospital. To colleagues and viewers, she projected confidence, preparedness, and a commitment to quality community-focused broadcasting. But behind the scenes, the bright and articulate Christine Chubbuck was being consumed by a profound unhappiness over her lack of romantic companionship. Having grown up feeling like an outcast, mocked for being a dateless wonder in high school, Christine remained fixated on her inability to find a long-term partner as she approached 30 years old. She confided in her mother about her fears of never getting married or having children, Christine's anguish only worsened after developing an unrequited crush on co-worker George Peter Ryan, who was already involved with another colleague at the time. Her family was unaware of her deteriorating mental health as she attempted suicide by overdose a few years earlier in 1970. 
but her mother chose not to inform WXLT management about her daughter's instability, worried that it could cost her her job and the independence she had worked so hard to achieve. In the weeks leading up to that fateful morning in July 1974, Christine's depression had reached a level of despondency that even her family and loved ones simply could not fathom. Her normal defensive personality grew even more erratic and troubling as the brilliant mind beating inside her became increasingly plagued by darkness and turmoil. Tragically, neither her family nor Christine herself understood just how far that darkness would soon grow. On the morning of July 15th, 1974, Christine Chubbuck arrived at the WXLT studios in Sarasota, confusing and concerning her colleagues. The 29-year-old told them she planned to open her Suncoast Digest program by doing a news rundown, something she had never done before. Unsettled, but having no true understanding of Christine's current state of mind, the crew went ahead with the live broadcast. After running through a couple of national news stories, the stone-faced Christine declared in an eerily calm tone, In keeping with Channel 40's policy of bringing you the latest in blood and guts and in living color, we bring you another first, an attempted suicide. With that shattering assertion, Christine withdrew a 30 caliber revolver and shot herself behind the right ear as the stunned crew watched her collapse right in front of the camera. Panic and chaos erupted as the technical director rapidly cut away to a public service announcement. Across the region, families watching WXLT that morning were left horrified and struggling to comprehend what they had just witnessed. A young woman's life ending in a violent made-for-TV tragedy? For those at the station who knew Christine, the tragedy carried even more trauma and anguish over the brilliant mind that they had seen gradually unraveling. But Christine wasn't dead. Instead, she was rushed to Sarasota Memorial Hospital, where the talented and tormented newscaster lingered in critical condition for another 14 hours before being pronounced dead on July 15th, 1974. In the wake of the shocking suicide broadcast, colleagues found Christine's own written script detailing how it would unfold on air down to her critical condition being announced. A stunned community mourned Christine at a somber memorial attended by over 120 people, among them local officials who had appeared on her show, friends, family, and the like. After a Presbyterian minister's eulogy reflecting on society's frightened, guilty, and confused feelings over her demise, her remains were then cremated, and her ashes were scattered in the Gulf of Mexico to the sound of her favorite singer, Roberta Flack. The shattering images of Christine's public suicide have never been released by the station, which reportedly handed the shocking footage over to a law firm for safekeeping. But the disturbing impact of that unforgettable July morning and the mysteries behind her brilliant yet troubled mind still lingers decades later. A woman celebrated for her intellectual gifts became forever defined by an unthinkable act of anguish and despair expressed with horrifying finality. Christine Chubbuck's tragic story serves as a wrenching reminder that even the brightest minds can be cloaked in darkness. And that mental illness, if left unchecked, can extinguish life's most brilliant flames far too soon. In the heart of Florida's Ocala National Forest, a mystery unfolded that would haunt the pages of true crime history for over four decades. On a crisp October day in 1966, two young women vanished without a trace, leaving behind a narrative so perplexing that it would challenge the very fundamentals of justice and perseverance. This is the captivating story of Pam Nader and Nancy Leichner, whose disappearance became a cold case emblematic of lost innocence in an unyielding quest for answers. Pam and Nancy, two vibrant spirits of their time, embarked on what was meant to be a leisurely outing with their significant others, Ben Doderman and Craig Mackey. Their destination, the serene yet sprawling expanse of the Ocala National Forest, the place where nature's beauty promised a day of adventure and relaxation. The plan was simple, 
explore the allure of Alexander Springs with a combination of picnicking and scuba diving. Yet fate had charted a course far from the day's innocent intentions. Upon realizing that the springs were too shallow for their diving aspirations, the group then changed plans, with the men opting to go for a hike, leaving Pam and Nancy to enjoy the tranquility of the picnic area. This seemingly insignificant decision marked the last moments the young women would be seen alive again. The return of Doderman and Mackie to an empty picnic spot marked the beginning of a nightmare. With Pam and Nancy nowhere in sight and their belongings left behind, silently bearing witness to their sudden disappearance, confusion quickly spiraled into panic. The initial thought was that the women might have taken a spontaneous walk through the park, soon gave way to a deeper, unsettling worry. The search began with urgency, a blend of personal determination and official intervention, yet as hours turned into days, the lack of clues and the impenetrable silence of the force compounded the agony. For all involved, the mystery of their disappearance was as dense as the foliage that surrounded them. In the wake of their vanishing, theories abounded, yet no one could fill the void left behind. The investigation, led by local authorities, stumbled in the shadow of jurisdictional egos and outdated methodologies. Meanwhile, the families of Pam and Nancy, gripped by unimaginable loss, faced not only the absence of their loved ones, but a growing realization that finding answers would be a battle against time and bureaucracy. As the sun set on Alexander Springs on that fateful October day, the shadow of uncertainty grew longer, casting a pall over the investigation into the disappearance of Pam and Nancy. What initially seemed like a straightforward case of missing persons soon unraveled into a complex web of missteps and controversies, highlighting the challenges of law enforcement in an era before digital records and DNA analysis. In the immediate aftermath of the disappearance, local authorities, led by the enigmatic Sheriff Willis McCall, launched a search operation. The sheriff's office, however, was ill-equipped for the complexities of a missing person's case that offered few clues and no witnesses. The early investigation was marked by a palpable sense of urgency, but hampered by a lack of coordination and modern investigative techniques. Sheriff McCall, a figure both feared and respected, wielded his power with an iron fist, his reputation tainted by allegations of brutality and racism. His approach to the investigation was, at best, antiquated, focusing on simplistic theories that lacked evidentiary support. Initially convinced that Pam and Nancy had run away, McCall's stubborn adherence to this unfounded hypothesis led to valuable time being wasted. As pressure mounted and the runaway theory crumbled under the weight of reality, the girls' belongings left untouched at the picnic site, McCall's focus then shifted towards the boyfriends, Dowderman and Mackie. This shift towards suspecting those closest to the victims, while not uncommon in criminal investigations, was marred by a lack of substantive evidence and seemed more of an act of desperation rather than reasoned deduction. Frustrated by the lack of progress and McCall's obstinate methods, the families of the missing girls then took matters into their own hands. They enlisted private investigators, sought the help of psychics, and even attempted to engage state and federal authorities, only to be met with bureaucratic hurdles and McCall's resistance. The sheriff, it seemed, was more interested in maintaining control over the case rather than solving it. This period of the investigation was characterized by a growing divide between families and law enforcement, a chasm filled with grief, frustration, and the nagging fear that justice for Pam and Nancy might never be served. As the years ultimately turned into decades, the case went ice cold. But its impact lingered like a shadow over those touched by the tragedy. Dowderman, in particular, bore the brunt of suspicion and the weight of unanswered questions. The cloud of doubt, though eventually dispelled by the passage of time and lack of evidence, never fully lifted, leaving deep scars that would forever shape his life in profound ways. As I said, decades have passed since the disappearance of Pam Nader and Nancy Leitner, and it's been shrouded in mystery ever since, a cold case that seemed destined to remain unsolved. However, 
the persistence of those who sought justice would eventually shed light on the darkness, leading to a breakthrough that altered everything. The turning point in the decades-long investigation came unexpectedly, rooted in the confessions of a man already notorious for his heinous crimes. Gerard J. Schaefer, a former Martin County Sheriff's deputy turned convicted murderer, was posthumously linked to the disappearance of Pam and Nancy. Schaefer, who had a sinister history of violence against women, had confessed to the murders of Nader and Leichner to a fellow inmate, a confession that had laid dormant among the inmates' notes for years before finally coming to light. The evidence that emerged connecting Schaefer to the case was compelling, if not haunting. Investigators armed with his confession and corroborated by additional evidence, including personal items believed to belong to the victims found among Schaefer's possessions, painted a grim picture of the girl's final moments. Despite the lack of any physical evidence to conclusively prove Schaefer's involvement, the circumstantial and testimonial evidence was enough to convince authorities of his guilt. This revelation brought a bitter form of closure to a case that had languished in uncertainty. Schaefer, who had been murdered in prison in 1995, could never be brought to justice for the disappearance and murder of Pam and Nancy. But the pieces of the puzzle finally began to fit together, offering answers to questions that had haunted their families, friends, and the community for nearly four decades. Thank you for listening to this episode of Deep Lore. If you'd like to know more, please follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow me on Twitter at Deep Lore. My name is Matt. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Have yourself a great day and peace out.